everyone, welcome to MindBrain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in MindBrain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about the domain of memory and learning. Memory and learning, it's a domain that is very important in clinical neuropsychology because there are several neuropsychological conditions that have memory impairments. So, it's very common to see individuals that have difficulties in memory, but first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology, the second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology, the third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on memory and learning. Memory may be described as the cognitive process that are used to acquire, store, retain and later retrieve information. Typically, memory helps us to maintain a sense of coherence of ourselves and the world around us allows human beings to learn and to keep learning during lifetime. And memory and learning is extremely important in everyday life. Typically, three major processes are involved in memory. Encoding, which means that mental information needs to be encoded to be remembered. Storage, mental contents need to be stored within different modalities, which may be described as levels of processing, in order to be kept and retrieval, which is the ability to recall stored information and to use it accordingly. Typically, we can differentiate two processes which are recognition and recall. Also, there are different types of memory. Sensorial memory, which is the ability to quickly understand what a stimulus is received by the senses. Typically, we can describe this as iconic, echoic and haptic memory. Don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos focused specifically on these kinds of memory, ok? Short-term memory, ability to recall mental contents for a brief period of time, within seconds to a minute and without rehearsing. Broadband found that our short-term memory typically have 7 plus or minus 2 items. And sometimes some authors describe short-term memory as working memory and working memory may be viewed as an executive function. Long-term memory, which is described as the lifelong storage of unlimited information, typically regarding to life experiences, events, abilities and so forth. So memory, it's a very important neurocognitive process because without memory we were not able to recall and to remember all the things that made us who we are. I can give an example, for instance, Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's disease, it's a disease that individuals start to lose their memory abilities that typically affects the episodic memory. Individuals start to lose the ability to recall things from their life because sometimes they can't even recognize their spouse. So we can look to the model of Atkins and Schifrin, which describes the process model of memory formation. Typically, when we see the sensor information, which passes to the short-term memory, and from the short-term memory, if mental contents are uh, rehearsed, they pass to the long-term memory. However, the information must be encoded through these different stages. And if mental contents are rehearsed sufficiently, typically they pass to the long-term memory. However, when we don't encode and we don't rehearse, all information tend to be lost. In sensory memory, typically the information is lost because it's not encoded. In short-term memory, typically information is lost because it is not encoded also. 
and if we don't increase the encoding of the information during these stages, typically in long-term memory, the information is lost to the retrieval failure. Now let's take to a more neurobiological model of memory. Memory may be divided in declarative memory or non-declarative memory. Declarative memory is divided in facts and events and tend to be stored in hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe and the diacephalon. Non-declarative memory, which tends to be described as the implicit memory, encompasses several elements, skills and habits, which are stored in the striatum, motor cortex and the cerebellum. Priming memory, typically is associated with the neocortex, and the basic associative learning, which may be emotional responses or skeletal musculature. Emotional responses are typically uh, stored in the amygdala, which is connected with the hippocampus, and the skeletal musculature patterns tend to be stored in the cerebellum, which is also connected with the hippocampus. Finally, the non-associative learning, which is associated with the reflex pathways. I know that memory and learning are very complex themes, but don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos detailing more of these aspects of memory, okay? Memory is a very complex neurocognitive process. So now let's see the summary and key points. Memory and learning is a human domain that is very important in everyday life and it's very important when we need to remember ourselves and we need to be able to adapt ourselves to our lives. So there are different types of memory elements and process and we saw that there are several neuronal structures associated with different types of memories. As I said before, don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos specifically talking about the specific elements of memory and learning, okay? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about language and communication. This domain is also a very important domain in clinical neuropsychology because there are several impairments in language that, that individuals may develop through several neurological conditions. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend for you today. So, the first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology, second edition. The fifth is Neuro Neuropsychological Assessment, 5th edition by Muriel Lezac. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology by Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. So now let's take a look on language and communication. Language may be described as a system of symbols and rules that allow us to communicate. Symbol is something that represents something else. 
just like a flag or just like a letter which represents a sound and language has rules which are specific ways of ordering symbols there is a communication when a signal is emitted between a sender and the receiver and this signal is understood language is a complex and dynamic system of combined symbols used in different ways to communicate and think this is the standard definition of American speech language hearing association. So, there are five channels of human communication. The verbal channel, which is a communication through words and phrases. Prosodic channel, which is the intonation, rhythm, accent and pauses that we use during our narratives and during our speech. Paralinguistic channel, which is referred to the tone of voice, silences, interjections and expressions such as crying, mm, yawing. We use these noises to communicate something without using words. Kinetic channel, which refers to movements, movements of the face, head, body posture or body gestures. Static features of the interaction, which is referred to the interpersonal distance, orientation of the body and the aspect of a person. Also, there are several linguistic processes. Fluency, which may be phonetics or semantic, which is the ability to produce different words. Object naming, which is the ability to give a name to objects. Word finding, which is the ability to find a word in memory and use that word within a given sentence. Grammar and syntax. From the neuropsychological perspective, may be viewed as the ability to learn and apply language conventions, such as grammar and syntax, in order to think and communicate simple and complex ideas. Expressive language, which may be viewed as the ability to produce adequate speech. And receptive language, which also from the neuropsychological perspective, may be viewed as the ability to decode and understand other speech. Language and communication is a very broad domain, but have several specifications that I've described here. These specifications are very, very important for the communication between individuals. When we have some neurological condition that affects the language communication, typically language comprehension or language production, individuals start to feel very isolated and start to have several difficulties in expressing themselves and to be understood by the others. So now let's take a brief look on the neuroanatomical structures of language. So there are several areas that are typically described as the neuronal basis for language and communication. The first is Broca's area, which is involved in production of speech. Wernicke area, which is involved in understanding of speech. Motor cortex, which is responsible for the controls of the movements of muscles. And the arcuate fascicles, which connects Wernicke's area to Broca's area. So, these areas are connected with each other and these areas are typically described as the main areas responsible for language and communication, okay? So, now let's see the summary and the key points. So, language allows communication between ourselves and others. We look to five channels of human communication and we saw that there are different types of language processes. And we look to basic neuroanatomical structures of language. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please like, share and subscribe this video to support the channel. Also, you can leave a comment on the comment section below, expressing your mind and expressing your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!